Sebastian, I am from Ignite 
where you guys are. We are the innovation hub for rural Nova Scotia. This is our first, it's kind of our second location, but uh, Yarmouth is our hometown. Um, we're currently opening up our second location too. Um, TBA on that. That's a new announcement that's uh, that's coming out very shortly. Um, you obviously are all here for the lobster bait challenge. If you're not, you're clearly in the wrong place, getting along with fishermen, um, which is always a cool day anyway. So stick around if you're uh, if you're in the wrong place. Um, for those on the live stream, feel free to comment and share whatever you do on the live stream. Um, we do have people uh, watching that. Um, I think about half this room is on the live stream too, so um, in number. So uh, we got some people on there too. Um, just give a big shout out to Danielle for getting everything set up. I know where nothing is in this place, and so she saved my ass this morning. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, and we have Perenia and Akoa here, who are co-partners um, on this project. And I'll pass it off to Marilyn here who will take it away and uh, kind of introduce the challenge, what we're doing here, uh, the purpose, and uh, kind of the why as to why we all showed up today. such a cool crowd. It's a pretty exciting project for us, myself from Perenia and um, Gail Edwards from Akoa. We've been working very hard uh, along with some partners here from Coldwater, Heather and uh, Bernie, and of course our industry committee. So this is um, a wonderful, exciting uh, project. We've been working also with Angelique from the uh, Western Wren, and uh, it's nice to have a project that's so collaborative from the very beginning, and uh, we think that's what's going to make a big difference in the success of this uh, project. So I also have here with me uh, my colleague from Pernia, Ashley Sprague. Ashley uh, works on a lot of different projects in the seafood sector at Pernia. It's really the two of us that uh, look after the projects on the Pernia side, uh, the development projects. And uh, Ashley is looking at a seafood accelerator program. She's the coordinator of that. And uh, she has some booklets here today, which we can um, she'll distribute, and she'll be available all throughout the day for questions or discussions. So it's a uh, funding program that's available for innovative products and innovative approaches to product development. That's a very small and short uh, summary of it. There's a lot of different aspects to it, but Ashley can better talk about that when you uh, talk with her later on today. So let me talk uh, a little bit about. Um, uh, Perenia and who we are. Oh, and first I want to say to everybody, feel free to stop uh, our speakers uh, as we move through this. We want this to be a very informal discussion and we want it to be any questions that people have, feel free to ask. We've tried to make the setup as an informal as possible and we have a Dr. Phil couch, so if you have any major problems, we'll try and solve them. <laughs> um, Okay, so Perenia uh, has been around for, I'll say, round figures about 20 years, and uh, but only in the last three or four have we been involved in the seafood sector. So uh, both Ashley and I came from the Provincial Department of Fisheries and have a, a background in working in the fisheries sector and developing projects. So what Perenia tries to do is we offer technical development and uh, for uh, both agriculture and fisheries. And we do that by offering um, some key services. Those services are uh, quality and food safety. So we have a division that uh, offers um, quality and food safety training, uh, product development to research and commercialize new products. And we also have sector development projects, which is what primarily Ashley and I look after. In the quality and food safety, we'll, we will do everything from uh, you know, help companies get ready for the SQF or BRC audits. And uh, we've been doing that for well over five years. And we've conducted in-house customized training. Uh, and we also
also assist in the facility design and support export plans with the interpretation of the new federal regulations. So we have a lot of different aspects and a very high percentage of our clients um, uh, are involved in the safety training for the seafood sector. So in Toronto we have the Innovation Centre. That Innovation Centre uh, works in product development. They also do some lab services in nut nutritional labeling, uh, uh, scale up, so taking a project from the recipe stage right up through to bench top testing and then into the pilot plant. So we have a, a, a kind of a miniaturized setup there that can help you with the various stages of value added product development or if you need a, a recipe tweaked and that kind of thing. So it's, it's a quite an interesting spot and of course they're always giving tours in that particular place. So the two key project areas that Ashley and I are focusing on right now are this waste or seafood byproducts. We're trying to tra change the language from calling it waste and to calling it seafood byproducts and from a waste stream into a value stream. So, um, and we also have the seafood accelerator as I mentioned earlier. So we hope with those two programs that we'll really be able to offer some strong assistance to the industry to move things forward and to make some differences in the bottom line, which we're all interested in. So, um, let me just see, make sure I have... Uh, so how did this project get started? Um, I'm going to uh, say that we had some conversations with Sean Donfermont, some Phil Blanc, and uh, Brian Sonnier, and everybody was talking about what what can they do with uh, with waste. That's more. What more can they do? Is, is it pet food? That's a, an interesting opportunity. What is it? So uh, when I spoke <coughs> with Akoa, they thought it was a good idea to try and have a real good look at that. And then we partnered with Ignite as well, the brand. So we pulled everybody in. So we had an industry, we met with the industry here. Uh, everybody from Lou Robichaud, uh, Alain Dantois, Scotia Harvest, uh, uh, Gabby Dantois, Nova Finus, Phil, as I said, Sean, uh, uh, B from Acadia Fishery. So a whole slew of uh, processors came together and we had a discussion around what the, what, what the picture is here for, um, for, uh, for waste or seafood byproducts. So we know that, of course, that during the season, you know, a lot of the waste can go to, uh, for lobster bait. And what happens at other times, so can go for mink feed as well. But we know that the mink industry is uh, a little bit less than it was five years ago, for sure. So that opens up the, the world of opportunity for what else can be done with waste. So pretty much around that time, uh, Ashley and I and another colleague went to Iceland. And we uh, found some really interesting information there. Oh, sorry. So in Iceland, they take the cod and they do all kinds of things with it. And the fillet actually was just one small part of what they get from the cod. And they make everything from uh, leather, that I have here somewhere, I don't mind my purse, uh, a, a wallet, which I'll pass around in a minute, made out of uh, salmon skin. And the leather that they make from the, the, the skin of the cod is actually less harmful to the environment than the typical uh, tanning process that's used for uh, cowhide and other types of hide. Uh, they also have a, a cold, uh, pre-cold product that uh, has proven to be effective in preventing the cold from blooming, I'll say for lack of a better word. That takes such a small amount, of, uh, they extract the enzyme from the intestine of the cod and that takes a very small amount to create a, a huge number of samples and they sell it, small bottle with that big for about $44. So a whole, it, it changes the whole thing completely. But what's different? is that in Iceland they don't have a lobster industry. So they don't have that place where they can put a lot of their waste. So they had to become a lot more creative. So that means that we can learn about some of the market opportunities that they've already identified. And that's part of this project as well, this overall big project that we're looking at in, in uh, seafood byproducts, is that we want to discover what are the opportunities, high value, low value, high volume, low volume, what else can we do with this and in conjunction with our partners, the industry partners, and in conjunction with 
um, other collaborator collaborators and funders. Um, so we know we know that um, the herring stocks and a lot of the typical stocks are diminishing. So uh, we know that in the U.S. they've gone from 50 metric tons to 21. That's uh, I think about 67 percent. That's the number you told me. I think right yeah. reduction. Uh, Norway is the same thing. Uh, they've cut back on their mackerel. And Canada, of course, uh, again, uh, in 2015, it was reduced by 15, 2017, by 15%. And we expect another huge cut in the next little bit, more or less reflective of what's happened in the States. So it, it's a good time to look at the, co the connection between waste and uh, the lobster bait industry. So we see this as an opportunity. <laughs> And it was interesting to find out just how many people are interested and have been working on the development of bait or have a, an idea, they've been fishing for a lot of years and have an idea of what they think would work. And we're going to have some of the industry people come up today and talk about exactly what's happening currently in the industry and um, what, where we, they think we can go. So we know that there's lots of different types of bait that are used at different times of the year and depends on availability and price and all that type of thing. So uh, I'll, I am in no way any kind of an expert in this, so I'll leave it to the people that are. And so I'm going to ask um, Sean, <coughs> Dr. Ma to come up. I'm always good with the last name Dr. Ma. Yeah, you can call everybody Dr. Ma. It seems to be yeah, the right one. Doing a good job. <laughs> So I'm going to ask Sean from Inshore Fisheries to come up and talk about exactly what what his interest is in this project and in the overall big waste scenario. Okay. Sounds good? Good. And you can sit down on the duck bill coach or you can stand there. Well, I'm not able to stand, and stand and, uh, some people here I know and some I don't. It's a great crowd. So uh, thank you, Marilyn. Um, how it started, Marilyn, when she worked for the Nova Scotia Department of Fisheries, did visit us a few times at our office and uh, took a tour around and saw us. And I thought that was really important for the for the government uh, people and uh, people in charge of programs to visit our communities to see what we're doing. We're proud of what we're doing, but I think we are. Uh, I feel we're underrepresented and underappreciated in many ways. Are so really appreciated when Marilyn and Ashley and those people come and visit and uh, we have a chance to show off what we're really proud of. So yes. thank you very much for that. My pleasure. I learn more, I'm sure, than you do. Yeah, <laughs> so, well, um, so anyway, uh, looking at the bottom line always, you want to try to improve the bottom line and uh, we're quickly going to figure out that you know, we sell more waste than we sell fish products. So how can we get more out of it? And uh, was a concern at the time, and still a concern about uh, the mink industry being uh, hit pretty hard with their their issues. So uh, we were <coughs> concerned, so we kind of looked uh, at you, Marilyn, from from her uh, Department of Provincial Fisheries portfolio, and I thought, well, she's with Perenia, and I knew uh, some of the uh, few meetings I've been with Perenia. They have come down here uh, in our area, and and promoted their the organization, so I knew about Perenia, so I called uh, Marilyn, and uh, here we are. So she did a great job of describing, I guess, the process, so how we got here. So here we are, and if, uh, that's about it. Any questions to anybody? Anybody have any questions? Carrie's here somewhere. He's dying to ask a question. Yep. So um yeah. That's about it, Marilyn. Yep, that's Perfect. fine. Thank yep. you. Great. No Thank problem. You. We'll get lots of chance to have discussions throughout the day. At this point, if if it's okay with everybody, I'd like to say two things. One, um, as you can see we're taking pictures throughout the day, so hopefully nobody has any problems with that. If you do, please let us know. And then I'd also like to do a round table so that we can introduce ourselves, uh, say where you're from, and if you, you know, what your interest is in coming here besides the obvious. Uh, Andy, can we start with you? Okay, uh, Andy Snare, I'm from Blanford. Uh, I have a, a lobster company there, and I have a business in Newfoundland. My interest is I, I think I might have an idea for an alternative lobster thing. Or at least an alternative. 
today. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, my name is Andre Leblanc. I work for uh, an organization called the Conseil de Développement Économique de nouvelle Écosse. We're a francophone organization that provides uh, business services to uh, owners like yourselves um, across the province. And I'm here particularly with two of uh, my business services and entrepreneurship uh, advisory consultants uh, to uh, chat with you guys. If there's opportunity for us to uh, help out, we're here to help. Hi everyone, uh, Marilyn introduced me. My name is Ashley Sprague, so I'm part of the uh, small but mighty, I like to think, uh, seafood team at Frenia. Um, I'm based uh, from Annapolis Royal. And uh, yeah, I'm really, really happy to be here today and learn from all of you. And we think there's a great opportunity <coughs> in the seafood byproduct sector. So it's hard we're to really excited to see what's going to go. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Valerie Lalonde, I'm with University of St. Anne, so I'm the industry liaison officer there. Uh, so I'm here to connect business people and other organizations. So we work mostly in the lodge industry out of our Cape Breton facility at our Marine Research Center. So I'm here to connect people. I'm uh, Daniel Carrier. I'm one of the business advisors that work for the Conseil de Development Economique at the um, Yeah, I'm here to, um, to learn and uh, meet people. Uh, so I can bring back to help uh, some of the uh, businesses I work with and potentially will work with. My name is Anna Belivo. I'm the other advisor that works with Andre. So I'm doing the same thing for the region of Clare. <laughs> I'm Vince Stewart from Clare Machine Works, and I'm interested in anything that has to do with the fishery. Cool. Oh, yeah. Very cool water lobster association. Uh, Heather Mullick with Cool Water Lobster Association. Uh, Tommy Miro, uh, Cool Water Lobster Director and uh, Lobster Fisherman for the Thunder Company. <coughs> Parnell LeBlanc, I'm uh, from Southwest Nova, a commercial lobster fisherman, and I've got a couple of ideas on alternative fishing. Right. Perfect. Sidney O'Connell, Little River Harbor, Lobster Fisherman, and I'll be one of the captains of testing the product. Wonderful. Thank you. Michel Dion, lobster fisherman from Pomito, interested the yes in different things. Well, the OBI, I'm part of a partner in a startup company. We're testing out there for date right now. I'm here to learn. Uh, Mark Priebel, uh, with Wally from PEI. We're, uh, we're halfway through an uh, alternative bait field test study right. with UPI. So we're testing 10,000 uh, units now. I'm Steve Gould. I'm from uh, Prince Edward Island as well, the PEI table. I was going to say, you're all saying we've got to be together. Anyway, um, I'm from uh, BioFood Tech, which is, uh, which is an organization that's subsidized by the government of Prince Edward Island. But we help uh, entrepreneurs get their ideas from concept to pilot scale and then hopefully from there on to a good market. So when you have an idea, that's that's where we come from. Welcome, Steve. Uh, Randy Peach, also from PEI. Uh, I'm with the PEI Bio Alliance, so we help early stage companies to commercialize new technologies. Uh, we have an incubator called Emergence, um, and I'm here to hear about or to learn about the alternative requirements for <coughs> alternative feeds. Yeah, I'm Russell Lees, I'm a professor at Kennedy University and been working on uh, what attracts lobsters for a few years and we have a few ideas, been working with Roland LeBlanc um, and again I'd be happy to discuss what we're looking at with anybody here. Hey, Brian Sony from Seacrest Fisheries, uh, we were one of the, and still are one of the largest users of seafood byproducts related to the mink industry and I'm here because our facility may lend itself quite well to alternative bait in terms of the manufacturing of it, depending on what the product might be, so that's why I'm here. <coughs> Fred Horner, I'm a semi-retired lobster fisherman, father and son operation. We're going to have a problem, and I just want to pull my ideas. Great. I just want to see what's taking place. Glad to meet you. I'm Gail Edwards. I'm with the Co Nova Scotia. I'm an economic development officer and I work under the Halifax office, but <coughs> very pleased to be involved with this initiative and you know, meet, meet me guys. So. Scott Sanson, the Looper Seafoods, and we're interested in partnering up. Uh, we've got uh, processing plants mainly in Cape Breton, but we have many different 
uh, byproducts that could be used in collaboration if people have ideas. So we're here to collaborate. Perfect. Trip Simmons, Louis Bird Seafoods, uh, what Scott said. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, maybe? Yeah. Uh, Sean Dontremont, <laughs> Inshore Fisheries. Alan Gillis um, from Gillis Seafoods. <laughs> I'm a partner with Bio Innovations in Anaganish, uh, partner in uh, live, live Ship and Live Store. We store lobster and we, uh, we're just getting into international shipping in the next few months of uh, live lobster. Great. So we have uh, a bait facility. <laughs> my name's Bill Lloyd. I'm a green crab fisherman from Lockport, Nova Scotia. We have federal licenses for uh, catch of green crabs. The licenses are available are open year round to us. We've been fishing uh, crabs as lobster bait now for a few years and we're able to capture both male and female crabs. And uh, we've recently, some people that are, we're associated with have been able to sell some crabs into Cape Breton and we have too, and actually into PEI as well, a few. And we hope to uh, expand the green crab fishery. We see it as a way to uh, help uh, with the bait problems that we see down the road and for other uses. And uh, we are able to provide samples and we'd be able to collaborate with anybody who was willing to talk to us about that kind of thing. And, we really relish this opportunity to get the word out a little bit that we need help with marketing and so on, but we do have, there is a big resource for an invasive species that we think we're going to put a, more of a push on now to try to get this fishery really, it's legitimized, but we want to, we think it can grow and we think we're missing a big opportunity here with this green grab. Yeah, great. Awesome. John Raymond, Blackwatch.tech, just here taking it all in. Okay. Uh, Bob Isaacson from Sandy Point Lobster, just represented a team of people who have been working on the alternative bait. I'm Ekora Akio, I'm from East Pabnico, I represent myself. Um, I used to work for a long time in biomedical research at the University of Calgary, and I'm here wanting to know about lobster bait challenge. Okay, Thank great. You. Julian Lambert, I'm a retired businessman. We retired in this area and um, twice a week with Ignite, this incubator, uh, helping mentor companies. Um, also have a business advisory in Toronto, uh, Edmonton, and in Hong Kong. I am Phil LeBlanc with IMO Foods. We can herring here in Yarmouth, so we're very interested in anything um, concerning herring and the fishery in general, of course. I'm Angelique LeBlanc with the Western Regional Enterprise Network, and we work with businesses across the, the region, helping them navigate resources, and we also <coughs> work on making Southwest Nova an even better place to do business. And I'll be up to talk to you uh, after that. I'm Michael Rayers uh, from Yarmouth, and I have a background in aquaculture. Up there to being comfortable and relaxed, if that's okay. So, look 
coffee, <laughs> Marilyn? Is there coffee still? Uh, yes. Yep. Thanks, Gail. Feel free There's to fresh coffee. Feel free to made. get coffee. This is not school. You can get up. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Please come. B. Sure, all the 
T's are crossed and the I's are dotted as we move forward. Marilyn? Can I ask, I think this is a good time to ask the question. Our experience with bait has been primarily herring mm -hmm. that we've been a distributor over the years, but I, I just have a question, I, I should know this, but there, I assume there's some kind of regulations within DFO that there's certain things you can't put in the trap, right? Is there? Can you put meat products, for example? <laughs> is it legal? That's my, my point. Well, actually, listen, as far as I know, sometimes a lot of this stuff gets out ahead of regulations sometimes. Because I can remember, and it's been 15 years ago, or maybe even 20 years ago, when the boats first started going to the deep water, um, there was actually a product around, it was uh, cow hide, and it was treated with chemicals and everything else. And we ended up, a lot of the, not all, but some of the boats ended up using that in fishery. And finally somebody recognized that there was chemicals in it and it was taken off the, uh, the market and stuff like this. So, unfortunately, I don't know if the regulations is out ahead of the product and stuff like this. Uh, but I think there's got to be checks and balances like that. Because you wouldn't want something like that to get into the fishery. Because, listen, th th today's world is so electronically connected. And, and if you had a bad bait, like you had something that was in a particular bait, a certain chemical or whatever, and that got into the press and stuff like that, well, you just kill your markets. So you've got to be really careful uh, moving forward and make sure all these things are tested. You know, if you're adding stuff like that, or if it's all natural, that's good too. But We're definitely going to be working with CFIA uh, with any of the products that move forward he from here uh, to make sure that we're not putting anything. I was, I was speaking specifically of a DFO regulation. I, it may be rumors, but I heard somewhere along the line that there may be certain products you can't use that in, are in regulation now, but that, that may be... Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, I'm sure another there example that uh, some uh, type of a bait we started using, and then it got hauled back, was I, I think we were using salmon cuttings, or uh, trout cuttings, for a little right. bit, 10, 12, yeah. 13 years ago, and that got hauled back out. Uh, unfortunately, we, and we did use some of it, but it should actually have been reversed. It should have never been used. Yeah. Okay, so. Hopefully there was a lot more. Can I ask a question? About what's the reason that the trout cuttings weren't uh, they were pulled out or pulled back? Uh, I think it had something to do with the feed that was into mm -hmm. the antibiotics. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. But there are there has to be regulations because we know that the Asian carp has just been Asian carp has just been approved, right? So they had to go through a, I think they had to go through the approval process, right? With the if I'm not yeah. It has been approved. That's my understanding. Since I when? I don't. I don't think. I, 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 I think the opposite. I read that. I read that article, but it was. Yeah. yeah I don't think oh, it's okay. Passed. No, I'm not approved yet. Okay. Yeah, I'm well, working on a project on that. There are definitely regulations as to what you put on your pot. You can't put female prey. Yeah. You can't put codfish. You can't put. Yeah. So definitely re regulations. Yeah. But we, I mean, we tried to have somebody from CFIA here today or DFO, but they just weren't available. But I can tell you that that will be a part of the overall process yeah. for sure. I'll Google it to see what I can find out. Okay. Right now. Actually, yeah. one of the unfortunate parts of the process is that it looks like the Canadian government is going to take the lead. American American acid is going to be okay for us. Well, I don't know. I still think you should do more due diligence and stuff like that. I'd like to make a comment. I think it's actually paramount that we find out what is allowed or not allowed because why go down the development path too far and spend money on something that's you're just going to fall off the cliff. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that's probably job number one. In that's the green crab fishery, we ran into similar problems marketing wise with which I don't think was peer reviewed science saying that if you use green crabs for catch lobsters and you held them in the pan, it, you know, that hurt us badly and we didn't have the resources to go back and say, is this peer reviewed science or is it, you know, it gets mm -hmm. out in the media and maybe there's no, you know, substance Olympia. to it. So yeah. that really, that really set us back. Like yeah. we were really starting to pick up that. and that. Yeah, I don't think it's ever been refuted. I don't hear any more about it, but you know, those kind of things can really submarine you. Yeah. Like he said, it's good to know yeah. what you can and, and, and can't do because, when, you know, when most fishermen thought, well, if the lobster goes over and eats the crab there or outside <coughs> the trap, it's not much different than going and eating it in the trap, you know. So common sense uh, sort of raised its head, but it did hurt us. Yes. Yeah. I would need a lobster out of there on the carpet. Well, let's, let's take that for an example. I don't know if anybody else here would have or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you're talking about trout cuttings and salmon cuttings and that sort of thing. In my experience, uh, it wasn't so much about the antibiotics, it's more from the point of view of uh, a farmer and a fish health point of view. The regulations made in Maryland can speak to that. There's more to do with the, uh, the husband.
husbandry of uh, the cuttings going out of the water and affecting other businesses, potentially. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. Anyway. No, I'm, I'm, what I'll do, definitely, guys, I'm taking notes on what, what we can't answer here. I'll definitely make sure everybody gets the information. We'll look into it. Yeah, there might be a, <coughs> excuse me, there might be a parasite aspect to that also. Parasite. 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 Paras
That was my question. Could be food, could be flavorings, could be all kinds of different products. Yeah, right? fine, well, yeah, yeah, something more valuable or something yeah. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the idea. The idea is that, I guess, a couple of scenarios could happen. Given the fact that bay is becoming, we think it's going to become higher priced because of mm -hmm. reductions in stock. And there, I think there are people in the main, main colonists now every day, we need bait, we need bait. So either you produce more bait and ex export some of it down to there, down to, down to Maine or wherever, so you, you get a higher value that way, or you lose, use less of that fish rack for your bait and divert some of it into those higher value streams. Now those are the brass ring, those are the pharmaceuticals, those are the nutraceuticals, those are the enzymes, the proteins and whatnot. And those are not something that's going to happen overnight. We, we're, we're not going to try and fool you. Those are down the road to be developed, but those are the really high value products. Like Maryland suggests, in pharmaceutical industry, you can imagine how much money can be made out of, out of proteins and enzymes. So that's kind of what's behind all this, this activity. But first of all, we need to first of all make sure that we're catching the lobsters, right? Nobody wants to jeopardize the lobster industry. In fact, that's one of your best customers as well. So we need, we need to make sure that that's okay. But if we can use maybe, instead of 100% fish in that bait, maybe only 60%, maybe 40%, maybe 20%. And that's the challenge to you guys, you bright minds. That's, that's, the, that's at the core of this bait challenge. What can you come up with that uses less bait, pardon me, less fish, but it's still as effective or more effective, perhaps, as Bernie suggests, so that we can maybe then have some of that byproduct put into higher value streams. And cheap, right? So because bait's getting the expense now. Well, there you go. <coughs> That's the other thing, too. It's more than double. I yeah. want to make sure you, you continue to have a supply to start with, and then the, 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 that would also help you yeah. have a half piece of supply. It helps keep the price a little more manageable. Right. Uh, just to get over the top so people can't afford it. What do the numbers now look like they, from the Heron and Michael quotas? Are they going to be at, if that's the present use of bait? I know it's a huge industry. How much does that look at compared to, or is there going to be enough Heron and Michael to probably I think, not? I think there'll be enough uh, uh, Heron, certainly. I think uh, Chris can uh, Phil. speak, or Phil can speak to this better. But I think for now, at least on our side, the Canadian side, we're okay for bait. But if if the cuts keep going and we get anywhere close to what the Americans have gone through, then we could run into a problem because there's only so much stuff to go around and everybody's going to be competing for it. And, and the price will, well, it's skyrocketing now, but it's going to go through the roof big time. But like I said, they, I don't think we're in any trouble quite yet as far as shortages on our side. But again, I think it was a 7,500 ton cut this year in the Heron quota from 42.5 to 35. There's strong indications it's not going to stop there uh, for next year. I think we're looking at even uh, another cut. Uh, so, well, we're, we're not, the thing that is, we're not feeling it here yet, but uh, it's going to happen in a couple of ways. Not only is it going to be the, the quota cuts, it's going to be the pressure that the Americans are, are just like uh, uh, Gail just said, the Americans are going to be coming over here trying to buy the same uh, bait because they're going to need it, and mm -hmm. other places are going to be coming here. And it's, listen, business is business. It's simply going to go for the high bidder. Love the supply and demand, right? Yep. Yeah, uh, What's the price now? Is it, are we seeing a price in Heron now? An increased price? Or? Uh, at least on the shore, Maryland, it's going to be probably coming on to fall, and again, these guys can speak to it better, but I tend to think there seems to be going to be a, a fairly decent jump in the cost of Heron this fall. Bill, what are you seeing? Anything right now? Um, yeah, the price will be going up. We're not... Um, we're buying fillets more than the whole fish, but Chris maybe can comment on it. Chris? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely more pressure on the price. But this American uh, bait shortage, we all expected uh, that to be a gangbuster for us, but we really haven't seen it yet. It's uh, the, their lobster season has taken off slower than normal. They're a month or so behind, <coughs> and we're. I thought our phone would be right, ringing off the hook, but it's not. We, if we mm -hmm. have any bait to sell, we have to call them. So it still may come. Uh, it's still early, and their their fishery is, they're catching some herring themselves. A little bit of quarter they have. So a lot of the bait dealers down there, lobster dealers down there, are, are storing up their bait. So they haven't. It, the big boom hasn't come yet. No, it may. 
yeah. in May. And, they, they um, did, I think another thing they did, Chris, they also opened up the, uh, I think it's called the Manhattan yeah. fishery. Yeah. 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 And they expanded the quota on that to land yeah. more of that to compensate for the potential mm -hmm. uh, slackness in the heron quota. Okay, yeah. stuff they like did, that. but the, I think the biggest thing is the fishermen just haven't been going out as much as they normally do with this time of year because the catch yeah. Yeah. are down. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing. So it's just, it, it has slowed it down. Yeah. And uh, who knows what will happen? I guess it's just yeah, a lot of game. Factors, yeah. it, it, but, but it will be a there will be an increased demand for sure. There there is some effect already in Newfoundland. Like the, the dairy group is holding it. They're a huge hand news for Newfoundland. They're holding meetings next week because the bait price has driven up the shore price of the herring enough that they have a traditional market for 80 percent of the herring they produce in barrels. To, to go to U.S. to, to make, so I call salmon and Gandhi and different products like that. Well, now they're shutting their plant down three days a week because they can't afford to buy the herring to produce oh, that product. Yeah, and, and the unions got involved. It's a, quite a big mess over there, and it's all related to the price of bait. Wow, that's not big so, issue. Price of herring. Yeah. Yep. I've got two questions from the live chat, if you don't mind, for you guys. Um, Lawrence Taylor, basic question, is there a clear understanding as to how quickly traditional baits attract lobster? Oh. How quickly? No, I don't think there's been any tests and stuff like that. And I, uh, I have another question here from Peter. He says he's working on an alternative lobster bait which does not use any fish or animal byproducts or chemical synthetic products of any kind. Is he still able to participate in the lobster bait challenge? Well, we're looking, we're, uh, in this challenge, we, we one of the requirements is that they use some fish waste. Yep. So okay. that's on the sheet on the website. You can check that and, and uh, get and the details. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Uh, no. Uh, just a question about traditional traditional bait use and uh, and the variability in lobster catches. Um, once you do experiment with a with a bait alternative, um, I know you would do side studies, the regular bait and the new bait, but uh, how do you how do you know how effective it's going to be? Like, uh, what is a traditional catch with a, a good a good fishing of a of a good traditional bait on a daily basis? Listen, I think there's so many variables there you can't on daily catch. Huge, huge amount of variables. Huge, huge amount. Yeah. In, in the time time of season, everything. It, it's just water temperature, yeah. bottom yeah. tides, everything. So oh, much. Yeah. 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 Uh, unfortunately, basically, basically yeah. a yeah. 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 I think we yeah. actually touch base on this yesterday. We probably won't have time to do this in this. Uh, Trying to develop a new bait as quick as we are. I mean, a lot of this, this testing should be done in a controlled environment and in some of the tanks, whether it be in Dalhousie Memorial and all this and stuff like that. I mean, we're going to be testing uh, some of the product in the wild and stuff like this. You know, some of the guys are going to be testing the baits. But again, there's still so many variables. Mm -hmm. uh, but but as, as far as the catch rate, geez, there's, and again, like, like the gentleman asked on the phone, there's never been a study really done on how effective these baits are. Uh, I mean, maybe when you think about it, maybe our baits aren't effective. Uh, maybe it's just because we got a huge volume of lobsters. We're going to dump the lots there. I mean, we can't help that way, eh? Yeah. Well, we, well, we did, when we were playing around with it, we, uh, well, all we can do really is compare 10,000 of ours against 10,000 without it. Yeah. In the same zone. Yeah. I mean, that's how we're gathering the data that we have. But I mean, you can't decide. Uh, what's the size of the lobster that goes in the trap? Or, right. You know, we, we, can, we can check to see if it's attracting more females or <coughs> less females. But it's, if it's, 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 it's a small it's test when we're comparing 10,000 against 10,000. Yeah. It still seems really it small is. with the amount of traps that are in the water on that day. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you mentioned that you, the use of bait. You take inside here in a lot of areas in the spring. If you use hair, really that's going to attract some legal uh, yeah. tinkers or whatever you want to call them. You know, your pots are going to fill up with that. That's yeah. why other, uh, most fishermen tend to use a different bait in the spring. I mean, yeah. herring still use, but uh, again, the, the size composition that you're yeah. catching is going to vary greatly. Yeah, it's hard, uh, yeah. it's hard to find out what an accurate is. What about, what about a compensation package, too? Like, if you're going to do a turn to bait, you're going to catch less lobsters perceivably with that as opposed to the one that you use in a regular bait? How, how 
are you going to effectively justify losing catch yeah. while you're doing the test? It's yeah. going to happen. Well, it's going to happen out of season. Out of season? Yeah, this is yeah. a very, very okay. small so pilot. Yeah. Um, and even when we talked about the at sea trials, um, I mean, the hope is, and we're still working on this, is that we'll try potentially three um, different bait okay. sources now. I mean, like, you know, Parnell and others have mentioned, there's so many different variables that sure. without a controlled environment, it's hard yeah. to do. And I mean, we could even cr come up with a bait idea that could attract a lot more bycatch and not the intended species. So, I mean, there's, this really is a, I mean, it's a grand scheme to come up with a, a better, or, you know, sufficient bait, but sure. it may not work. I mean, You're going to have a really hard job to set a bait so You have to figure out water temperature, what, what are your issues. And that's, what? we're working on, you know, um, when, we, when we were talking, we met yesterday and we were going over some of the variables and, um, I mean, obviously we have to have a control trawl and we have to have a test trawl and we have to have the same bottom type, same depth, um, potentially the same uh, bottom temperature, same, you know, the time and everything, but there are so many variables, but in the end, I mean, this is really just to put some ideas out there, get industry and academia thinking about this because this could be a serious issue in five years uh, for this industry. Is there uh, different baits that's used at different times at different seasons? Yep. For example, herring and mackerel at one particular season, or redfish or flounder at a different yeah, time? Yeah, a lot of it's left up to the, the individual fishermen. Everybody's got their own favorite bait and stuff like that. But uh, right. again, I think if you go down on the eastern shore, they, they're still using a fair amount of mackerel when it's available and stuff like that. They just tend to think there's a better bait or whatever. Uh, but there's a lot of variabilities with even our within our industry, uh, everybody's got their own thoughts of what a, what a better bait is. Listen, you mentioned redfish or haddock cuttings or whatever. It's really a, a, up to the preference of the uh, fisherman and what's working for them, what depth of water they're working in, and stuff like that. And also, there's certain times of the year that listen, your bait's just going to get chewed up. Like if the, if the bottom temperature gets to a certain point, sand fleas are just going to eat your bait no matter what you get there, or or uh, slime eels. Uh, so just eat it within hours, uh, so your pot's not fishing. There's nothing you can do about that. Do you find that a, a different bait in a particular region attracts more because it's a different uh, a different diet? Well, yeah. it, it could be. Maybe it's, uh, I think it would lend more to the size of the lobster type thing, I think. Yeah, I mean, cuttings, I mean, it's more of a traditional deep water bait. Not that they don't use hair in the first of the season, but they very quickly transition <coughs> to cuttings and stuff like this. Okay, and I'm finding that fishermen don't want their cuttings anymore. They want the whole fish. The whole fish. That's the thing, because before the, the fillets were all gone, and basically you wanted to make sure that the cutting still had the belly in it. They give you a little so bit of it. Okay. The beauty with the way we and uh, Alex and Tommy go and Sean, same thing, uh, round. So when we take the fillet out of the fish, we still got 90% of the fish weight. Can you speak up a bit? And they ran that. Can you speak up, right. please? And rather have the, the, the fish with the guts, not just gut the fish. Okay, mm. makes sense. For us, I don't want to take over here. No, For us, uh, in our business, we, uh, we it's all uh, it's all fish that hasn't been fed, all caught. Uh, I'm not here to to run down the agriculture, but there is problems sometimes with the feed and chemicals and that stuff. In our in our fish. Money sometimes if we would do it. We we can do we can do we can get a way better price for a whole fish than fishing the lobster fishery. Mm -hmm. This lobster fishery is big. You know, it, it's a big part of our business, big part of our business because we we process mm -hmm. and we have the raw material. Now, when the lobster fishery closes the end of May, we see a big change. You know, and also, I don't want to say anything bad about the major stuff. We depend on them too. So. It's about a 50-50. As far as the fishermen, I depend, uh, the question is here, uh, yeah, fishermen do come and buy fish, uh, bait right to our plants, but mostly dealers, they'll buy 10,000 pounds at a time, and they'll have, you know, different areas along the shore, they'll have bait for the fishermen. Fishermen go out all night, all day. When they come home at night, they're not going to travel back and forth with the bait, they want to right down the water, and you can't play. So this is the type of stuff that's going on. But like I said, 70% of the fish is still there after we take our fillings out. So mm. all that 70% of the fish, we're trying to make.
was out there the fat content. And actually, I think there's a christening when they when they put the bait down, you actually measure the fat content in yeah. some of the baits. And, and it's funny how this has evolved over the last 10 years. Just fishermen now will shop around and they're looking for bait con or, uh, fat content in the air and they're buying part of the fat content. They'll pay more for that bait. And again, I'll go back to something like a piece of that, like a price point. Because I think fishermen, are, even though bait is getting very expensive, I think fishermen is willing to pay more. The only thing is it's got to be a, a bait that's performing, meaning catching more lobsters and stuff like this. As long as something's working, the industry is willing to pay more. You know, up to a certain point, everything's got a price point, I guess. But, but you, you've got to see a return on that. And that's why I mentioned earlier, <coughs> I think we've got to be aiming higher as, as opposed to just, and I keep calling it the heron baseline, which we kind of don't know, we're just, but if you can improve on that, uh, you know, you, you can, you know, the guy selling bait can charge more, if you're catching more lobsters off that bait, so on and so forth. When do you guys decide whether they're going to use a bait bag versus a spike? Does it depend solely on bottom type? Not necessarily. Uh, spring or spring or less, mm -hmm. what time of year? Yeah. Uh, Water temperature. <laughs> In the winter, you want to we'll call it a hard bait or something to call out because you're not going out every So, the bait bag is just to keep it contained in sample. The bait bag, let's water. say, you know, let's pretend the bait bag is to get them there quick and the cutting is there to keep it fishing. Yeah. Yeah. If you want something that's going to stay for the bait bag, might last two days, the cutting might last another three, four. If you want something that's going to keep the lobsters coming for four, five, six days, pretty much none of them have a trouble. We put pipes on that far from the bottom because of sand leaves and put bait. So we thought that would oh, help. Yeah, it up. we thought that would help. It never helped. There's no there's better, there's there's no no better no innovator than the fisherman train. The bait bag that passes around. We've tried uh, dogfish, skates, uh, swim. Oh, yeah. The sand leaves and the bags. You know, I, I, again, I go back to if I could, if you go back to the price, some of the, some of the prices being paid for bait at different times of year is just you know, an unbelievable number. I mean, for example, especially in the spring, uh, grubbies. Uh, like a crate of grubbies would probably go around 200 pounds or something like that. Small, small scallopins or grubbies and stuff like that. I mean, that's fetching me now, last spring, north of $600 in cash for a crate of grubbies. Uh, flounder, if you can get them. Flesh round is 2 to $3 a pound uh, and stuff like this. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. And the reason the fishermen are willing to pay that is because that's the thing bait is working. Right. At that time of year, right? Not always work. Can I can I mention that maybe we should also consider uh, environmental issues regarding the like plastic during our, our this process? You know, too much plastic, the dolphin in, in bait ends up in the in the water, and that we should consider. Ways of minimizing that. Yeah, we need organic bait or something. Yeah. Packaging yeah. and uh, yeah. Yeah, the less packaging, yeah. the, 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 that type of stuff. We should consider those considerations when we're looking for yeah, the process. Yeah. 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 So the answer to the question about the bait bag as opposed to the spike is just the spike is used for like a whole fish yeah. or longer. The, the spike is used with the bait bag also. But yeah. But at certain times of the year, okay. you can put on two kinds of bait or maybe one kind of bait depending on again water temperature, bottom type. Oh, okay. Um, so what kind of lobster you're, you're what kind of lobster you're hunting? Are you hunting a lot of small lobsters? Are you hunting big lobsters? <laughs> bottom type depth. Um, area. Wow. Um, there's a million different variables. So this is the spike and this is the sand flea bag, right? Does that work? Does that work well? Sand flea bag? Yeah. Depending on. Yeah. If you're if you're does in deep water. Does it keep the sand fleas out? Just to keep the sand fleas. Does it does it work out. to do that? Yeah, but it won't work as good if you're fishing somewhere that the lobsters crawl quick because it doesn't release as quick. You want to mesh a big mesh to let the fish out. If you're hauling your traps every day, 
You don't want that. Yeah. If you're hauling once every five days, then you want that. You want something, obviously, that's going to last for the full five days. Yeah. I can only go by personal. Someone had asked a question, does different bait affect your catch rate or whatever? I can go by personal experience from last spring. I fished a different area that I hadn't fished in years. And I had heron and uh, <clears throat> redfish heads for a three day set. Mm -hmm. And then I, I said, well, maybe just redfish heads would, would work just as good. Catch went down to half. So the heron yeah. in the bag yeah. actually helped my catch that yes. much better. Yeah. It's a quick pull list. Yeah. Everything else you put on there is to just keep them coming. Yeah. Yeah. The heron is the primary. That's what's bringing The heron is coming over the water. Uh, I, I, I figure, yeah. Because they smell the oil, right? Something really oily, but then use anything underneath on a spike so that it's slowly releasing oil to draw them in. We've used dog fish, we've used skate, we've used you name it. Never mind, that's my pitch. <laughs> in my dog fish <laughs> body. <laughs> well, now everybody knows that. <laughs> 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 say in regards to what works and what doesn't work there's an awful lot of valuable information out there has yeah. ignite or perennia put together this information has anybody collected it I mean, there's thousands of trials have been done the science has been done no, the data is there yep i mean that's a very good step to know to-do list absolutely yeah. Yeah. put that on to the to-do list yeah. definitely yeah, yeah. 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 Just wondering when you do your testing uh, on the alternate turn of the base, how many are you going to do? Like how many different? Is it going to be one winner or one? Uh, We're going to test three. See? Three, three different products. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And come up with one winner. And uh, as Cutter said, we are not um, making this the kind of the 
the mecca of alternative faith. We are we are making a start at trying to identify an alternative faith. We fully expect that this will be the start, not the end. Right. And uh, as and I think what uh, I think today is proving that what we'll find is that as you say, Russell, there's lots already being done. It's great to to collect and collate that to figure out, okay, what are the, the strong directions that we should be moving in, and what do we need to fully exercise and develop a, an alternative faith? I mean, there is a potential that we could come up with three guns, and that's okay. I mean, you know, um, you know, five years from now, maybe herring and mackerel might not be the primary bait that lobster fishermen use, because they are forced to look at something different because of the uh, uh, quota cuts. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, right now as we look at it, I mean, like I said, there's so many, a controlled environment would be best, and I mean, we, we've actually talked about that in some of the, the tank houses, if we could have access to one of their tanks, and uh, for one week we test, we might even have a pre-trial, if there's like a fourth or fifth entrant that comes in, and we're like, oh, you know what, this is a possibility, I mean, a big failure would be you come up with a bait, and in two hours it completely disintegrates. Well, that, that's a waste of fuel, your crew's time, so it's just not useful, so there are many things that have to come into play when we look at the evaluation criteria, and uh, Perenny and Ignite are working on that, along with the processors. Um, in cold water, we're going to step away from that, because uh, we are lobster fishermen, so we don't have the upper edge, but every, like you hear in this room, every guy will tell you something different. So, it's going to be like control test in a tank? Well, it's not, actually. We're going to do it at sea, but if there are too many, we may test them uh, right away to see if they even pass that pre-trial. Like, if they, this yeah. is if we can get access to a tank, to see if they can get to disintegrate them. It's not, it's not useful unless they can come up with some binding agent or something that I think they can last for a longer time. I think to follow up on Heather there, I mean, I, I think there is an idea that we might follow up with a tank house. I mean, it's not a, a university uh, tank or anything like that, but if you, if you had a tank house and put different baits, you know, in a pot and stuff like that, distribute lobsters in that particular area and give it a 24-hour limit. You could test, you know, whatever, four or five different baits and stuff like that, start eliminating them and stuff like that. And that's more of, it's not a perfect place, but it's more of a controlled environment. If, if you do that. that. And, and you can watch it. And you can watch it and yeah. stuff like that. And then and it's it's water temperature. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And, and, and then the water temperature would be the same, the depth, all this kind of stuff. And the key is just trying to, again, reaching out and finding a, a, a buyer that, well, a lot of the buyers are emptying their tank houses now a little bit, so there is room. It's just trying to get somebody to play along. Chris? Uh, you have to be careful of doing it in tanks. For example, on our lobster cars, if a crate will open mm -hmm. and we put a pot in there to catch those, to pick up them lobsters, if we bait the pot, we won't catch it. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. They probably should do it in a lobster car. You have to put it in with no bait. It's better in a lobster car with no bait. It fills up. It fills up. You'll get it with no bait, but if you put bait, you won't get them. So be careful what you're doing in a little controlled environment. But as for the actual trials, there are three vessels that are lined up, uh, different areas, and there'll be one control trawl, like I said, and one with the, um, the test trawl. Um, we're hoping to get as closely um, the same bottom type as we can, uh, the same area, same depth. So those are some variables that we can somewhat control. Um, and then at least a, soap, a minimum soak time of at least 24 hours. That's what we've set as the minimum. So. Yeah, I think out in the ocean is the way to do it. it is. If you do it in, a in a tank, from our experience in a lobster car, maybe a tank, a cement tank is different. But this was really more so to see if it would hold up. That it's not, yeah, not necessarily yeah, having lobster yeah. crawl yeah. in. So in, uh, in Florida, <coughs> there's, in Florida, the combining lobster fishermen <coughs> have a permit to keep undersized lobster in their trap because that attracts the bigger lobster if you put bait or turtles feed the pot of people to use a wooden trap. So they have a permit to keep undersized lobster because if there's the same principle as the empty trap in the lobster, <coughs> once some lobsters go in, it's a herd mentality. They're all in. You'll see them in a lobster pound and there'll be none over here, and yep. 70 pounds over there, all in a man. Another thing, uh, you have to con consider the weather, the water temperatures. Is, you know, if you go in the, in, the, in the summer months, the water temperature is going to be a lot different than the fall and the early spring. And that's going to affect how the, the spring is frozen, how quickly it dissipates, or how quickly it's going to. And, and, you know, if you use a bag or use a box or something, the, the dissipation rate is going to be different. Yeah. And that's what the conditions of the lobster are showing. We're going to try to do the test in October, trying to get past a good portion of the hole, but we're not going to get past all of it. 
So is the water going to react differently in the milk process as opposed to when they're hardened up? Again, it's been pointed out numerous times. There are so many variables that we simply can't control. It's just yeah. really... I like this more, think of it more as a, a think tank than anything. Because, I mean, even if the results come back extremely successful, it's still going to take a long time before you change the minds of fishermen to, you know, step away from herring and mackerel. Yeah. I mean, unless Parnell comes in and he's coming in with thousands and thousands of pounds each trip. And he'll Parnell will we'll talk yeah. good on the <laughs> team. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm not doing so well. Or, uh, he'll be telling everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more so to get, uh, get the industry to work with academia or processors and uh, to really start thinking about this as an issue. But yes, you're right. There are so many variables. Maybe it should be something where you all can advance and work together. Yeah. 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 Ye
way they even knew from that. This year they started going outside at 12 fathom was the <laughs> now they're going out to 15 yeah. and catch some monsters. <laughs> so someday they'll be out in 100 fathom. Yeah. We, we've seen with the green crab in innovations in trap changes as well. This big spike, the crabs are small, it's too big. People have actually put small spikes. People who use green crab every day, and we use what we call them pie plates down home. I don't know if any of your traps there have them. It just, it's a, a piece of mesh by the spindle, and they just lift it up. It's got a, it's got a bungee cord. They crack them, yeah. they throw them in, like and they don't ever take that bait off. It's not like that bait's gone tomorrow. It's a, a heap of shells until it's a mess, and then yeah. they clean it off. So I think traps can be changed as well to uh, for a certain type of bait. Like yeah. You have to be open-minded, and fishermen certainly are. They've been studying this hard and making the type of bait they have acceptable to the type of uh, thing to hold the bait. Yeah. Listen, I think you bring up a very good point, so I think as this fishery, this lobster fishery evolves, not only do you even need a better bait, but I think even a better pot. The catch, uh, there hasn't been a lot of study done in Dow has done some studies on lobster pots and a couple other areas, but I think moving forward, you know, you're going to leave less of a, a footprint, uh, you know, in the fishery and stuff like this. If you can improve your catch rate of your pot and your bait, you could really, nobody wants to talk about this, but you could reduce your pot limit substantially and still catch the same amount because you get a better fishing pot and better bait. Okay? That would lower your expense, time on the water, fuel bill, safety, da 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 it just goes right down the whole gamut. It, it's uh, down in District 33 where we sell most of our green crab. We find fishermen look at how many traps can be baited out of that crate of crab. So they do actually look at what, at the end of the day, and a lot of them's individual fishermen or father and son outfits or tight small outfits, not the big offshore outfit. And he looks at the end of the day at what his bottom line is. And if you can bait more from that many crabs, you know, that they're studying that all the time. So there's a lot of things to look at. Okay. Well, how about we get uh, Brian and uh, Stephen up and talk a little bit about formulation. Me and Bernie, thank you so much. Um, everybody's going to be around for lunch, which we'll do in a few minutes. And uh, we can continue the discussion. Thank you both very much. We use all the work that they do a lot of for you. Is that all the work that they do?
fatty, you talked about that. You've talked about the different species of fish. You've talked about some of the um, the species that you shouldn't have in the trap for various reasons. But every fisherman sort of has their own plan on which way they're going to do it. There's temperature and there's other things. So you have so many variables to deal with. What I'd like to talk about a little bit or, or maybe start a discussion with is the formulation part. Now you have your idea. You have the components that you want to put into your bait. How do you get it in there and how do you keep it in a manner that's not going to just disappear in two hours, it's going to disappear in four or, or two days, some of those criteria. Now a lot of you can, can come up with your own idea and figure that out no problem at all because you're used to having a lot of different pieces of equipment to work with and, um, and you can you know, squeeze things together, you can blast freeze things and, and try to slow down the, the process of which the, the bait bag or the bait will disintegrate. But you only have, a, you have a limited amount of tools at your disposal. And, but there are other tools that are out there in the food industry, in the bioscience industry, and other things that can sometimes add to your toolkit so that when you're trying to formulate something in a manner that, uh, that will stay long, will still have all of the components, will fish for 24 hours or 72 hours, then uh, you need to expand your toolkit. And that's some of the things that we do at BioFood Tech. We can offer uh, other piece of equipment. Maybe you need to dry something down quite a bit before you add it to your formulation. Maybe you need to blast freeze at a certain point. Maybe during your production you have to keep things cool or warm at different points. And all of those things need to be controlled if you're going to make a consistent bait. The other aspect, as you mentioned, is that there's such a variety of baits. So once you've got a formulation, you've got to be able to manipulate it. You've got to be able to say, okay, this is a deep water fish, and I don't know which way is right. This is a deep water uh, traps. These are going to go in the in the winter. They're going to go down really deep. The temperature's going to be this, so we want to make sure there's this much fat in or this much fat in Those are the sorts of things that a formulation and knowing having the right tools at your disposal can help you achieve at a much easier rate. So I just wanted to start with that comment, and now I believe your PowerPoint. Well, it's not really PowerPoint. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the picture. Sure, I'll, I'll go Is that the right one? Yeah, start with, start with there. Marilyn approached us oh, a couple of years ago because we were a, a big user of fish byproducts, I guess you call it, from the, the ground fish industry in Nova Scotia here because we're a mink beef facility. And uh, when the mink industry started declining and the fact that the lobster fishery was increasing and the bait was becoming more scarce, they approached us because our facility may be, depending on what alternative bait could be developed, our facility may be a good place to possibly manufacture some of this. So I'm going to run you down a little bit of what we have in equipment here just to, to essentially um, give you ideas in case some of this stuff could be done at facilities such as ours. We're based in Comoville and are, we've been around since uh, 1983, so we've been around for quite a few years. We generally, at the moment now, we can use, we've been using uh, ground fish frames, we've been ground, ground fish guts, we've been using hagfish, salmon, uh, all, all those kinds of meat products, poultry products as well, in, in Minkby, just to give you a general idea. So our facility is equipped uh, to both handle a lot of fresh product, grinding, mixing, and as well, freezing product as well. So depending on the stage of an, an bait, we could freeze possibly raw materials to put in the bait, or we could grind it, mix it, and freeze it again, or put it out fresh. Um, go to the next one there. So we do have um, a fairly high capacity of grinding and mixing. We can grind and mix up to 100,000 pounds an hour. So in terms of the capacity, in terms of an alternative bait, depending if, if it's a, a bait that we could use in our facility or manufacture, we could, you know, the volume shouldn't be a problem. So we have several grinders, um, mixers as well. Those are everything is, you know, essentially food grade stainless steel. Uh, we do have as well uh, different abilities to grind different sizes. We can grind from uh, an, an inch and an eighth hole right down to several millimeters. So we can have several different steps in the process. Uh, we can add as well, is that one there? I can see it. Yeah, we do have three different mixers, so we can be, be mixing different products in each mixer if need be. 
You can also add, we're equipped to add dry product as well. So if you have to add, you know, a grain type product, a fish meal or a poultry meal or any kind of dry product to the mix as well, we can do that as well. Uh, several large holding tanks, obviously with that capacity. Most, some of them refrigerated as well to hold product prior to either freezing or dispensing out fresh. Uh, again, that's another example there of the different grind sizes. So that would be a very, a fairly fine grind of the, the product coming out. Uh, in, in terms of the freezing capa capacity we have, we can either freeze raw materials prior to making an alternative bait, or we can freeze the alternative bait if, if it ends up being something that needs to be frozen. Uh, a lot of the stuff is automated as well, so volume is not a problem. We do have uh, also automated lines to stack on pallets. Um, this is an example of, that's actually frozen ground fish. And I took a couple of pictures of this. This is just frozen ground fish. This would be from primarily from mink meat, so the block size is fairly large. Um, there you can see ground fish as well as it's thawing out. And one final picture there. That's an example without a binding agent. So if you're, if people are thinking of, you know, grinding ground fish or grinding some kind of waste product, when it thaws out, that's what you get fairly quickly. So, you know, you have to start thinking of binding agents or something to keep together. But that's been discussed quite a bit here today. We we also have the capability to actually package product as well. So if it's a, if it's going to end up being a frozen type bait at the end of the day, we can package that. And obviously, you know, yeah. Package it, wrap it up. Packaging involved, though, and we've we'll talked a little bit about the environmental issues there. Again, we can freeze raw material that would go into bait. That's the herring you see there. And we do have the capability as well to cut the final frozen product into smaller sizes. So I guess that's the quick rundown of what we could possibly lend to the industry if somebody comes up with a bait that needs to be ground up and mixed and frozen. Where are you located? We are in Cumbleville, which is about a half an hour from here. Exactly halfway between Big Bean Yarmouth. Okay. Well, how many pounds can you freeze it a day? Um, probably, you can freeze probably around 140 tons, 24 hours. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you got to remember, the, you know, we were built uh, as a, a fish crossing company, extensive background in herring, paid as well. We got involved in the mink industry, and well, in the early... 2000s and up to probably five years ago, the production of mink was going up up, up, up. So we, we have you know, quite a bit of capacity because the volumes were enormous eh? yeah. in terms of, of the amount of waste we were handling. But just coincidentally, the mink industry is going down now, mm -hmm. so our facility is, has the equipment is capable of, of doing more than we are still making mink feed now. But um, you know, I wouldn't bet that that will continue in the future. So. There's, there's a need to, to yeah. do something with this waste in the summer months in particular. Yeah. That's definitely a solution for the, the full scale production. Yeah, yeah. And all of my equipment is much smaller than that. Yeah. It's so, um, it's, it's much tinier, but similar similar ideas, but it's mainly to, to design it for a pilot scale. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Small tests and that sort of thing. And, uh, I mean, the challenges are, are the binding. I think in the early 80s someone came up with plaster of paris really they, they actually they actually um took some bait alternatives and they what they based them on were some of the, the things as fish is rotting in water with the different compounds that come out of it like putrescine and creatine and a few other things like this that come out and they tried to mix it up with this plaster of paris and then they could formulate the plaster of paris with some different tools to try and let it uh, let these chemicals out at different rates. Now, from what I've been hearing, the industry has tried these pucks a long time ago. This was in the U.S. mainly, uh, and they just don't they don't seem to fish. So that's that's not working. But there's all kinds of alternatives um, out there. So if there's anything that you need when you have your formulation. We're open to, to discussing some options with you and try to help find. You, you may find a technical problem that you have, and uh, with either of us, we can we can probably help you uh, try and a, a tool that you never thought of to try and keep it together, or keep the material together, maybe even let it keep it longer and other things like that. Okay, so 
I guess the point is, when Marilyn approached us, not, not that, uh, you know, depending on if there's an alternative base that's developed, that the infrastructure may be out there, such facilities such as ours, that we could assist the, the industry or the whoever comes up with this bait, and instead of investing, you know, many seven figures in this kind of equipment, we are there to, to help yeah. out. If, if we need. And I think the other important aspect is that uh, it, it's here in Nova Scotia, we're not, it's not in the States, it's not, we're doing it, we can do it here. And I yeah. think to know what, what your facility is capable of may come in very handy for for the needs that we're talking about here today. Yeah, exactly, yeah. so hopefully you keep that in mind if somebody comes up with something that you there, uh, we're always around to help. Brian, what kind of product lines do you have right now? You're doing uh, the uh, dried haddock skins, I think? Well, we're doing, with the decline in the mink industry, we, we, we had to do something we, with our ingredients coming in. We had a lot of fish products coming in. We tried to keep as much as we could, so we are actually selling some ingredients now to the pet food industry, because our ingredients that we had coming in for mink feed, uh, meat products, poultry products, fish, herring, salmon, hackfish, that kind of stuff, a lot of the pet food companies for wet pet food use the same type of ingredients. So we have been actually diverting some of our products into that industry at the moment, which has enabled us to keep taking most of the ground fish that the industry had, has had. So we're doing that. We, we're doing a little bit of uh, dehydrated pet products as well, using okay. fish skins and that kind of stuff. Okay. But we're primarily because of the nature of the facility, which is a large volume, large capacity facility, we're more geared towards the pet food industry in terms of like a commodity type product. And I think, you know, as we said earlier uh, this morning, this lobster bait challenge is kind of like step one, and we still see the identification of other opportunities, Sean, we're still talking about pet food and things like that to find out exactly what is possible in that pet food side of things. So we haven't, we're not taking that off the table because we have the lobster bait challenge. This is just one opportunity, and we see there probably won't be many opportunities to use the seafood byproducts. You know, we just look, look at that uh, Icelandic cod picture that we show so many places. You know, there's lots of other ideas and lots of other opportunities. What kind of binding agents have been used in other uh, fishery baits to keep them composed in the past? Well, in some cases, they've used uh, some grain products like soybean and things like this in order to try and you know, you've got more dry material and wet material together so that you can get it together and, and more or less press it or extrude it through something you can sometimes keep these things tightly together. Um, there's a number of different ages, the same agent, same things we would use in the binding of food products in some cases, you know, to make it more gelatinous and that sort of thing so it doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, just dissipate into the, into the ocean quickly. Uh, and freezing is an asset. I mean, it's still a problem on the wharf because people want their their product brought to the wharf the day before. It's almost 24 hours sometimes on a on a hot wharf. So unless you have it in a cooler or you have it on the boat, and it's it's uh, getting warmer and warmer as you're going out. So you don't want it really soft and soggy. You want something that when it does come to room temperature, it isn't just going to turn into a mush that when you put it in a bag. Do most of the boats now have freezer capabilities no. on them or not no, really? No, no, no. Yeah. Currently you use a cooler or something for your bait? Is that, that what you use? Mother Nature. Mother Nature. You might wrap it with a uh, tuna bag or yeah. insulation or something. Yeah. Okay. You, want it, you want it to be uh, workable. You want it to be a chair. Yes, it needs to go in a bag or it needs to be stuck on the spin so it can't be wrong. <coughs> Most of the boats have cutters? Some. They're getting away from them. Oh, are they? Little okay. by little, yeah. Yeah. Safety, they're, they're oh. dangerous, they're bulky, they're, they're expensive, they're very good. Right and yeah, a lot of guys are going through, they want to put a hole here in their bag so the boats are cut up. Oh, okay. Everybody's, there's so many, again, so many, so many differences. Variables. Yeah. Okay. Well, like I said, a couple of weeks ago, I had a member come in and tell me that uh, he used to take his son. 12 year old son crabbing, which is you know, a long haul and a hard work. And this year he decided.
decided not to go because he was going off the wharf with a, a rod catching sculpin and selling them three dollars a piece. <laughs> I mean, at 12 years old, he was making pretty good money. I'd say I can make quick money. Doctor, you can charge with you. Wasting your time. So, Brian, is there anywhere to make your fat content? Yes, there is. Yeah, and we do have. Well, we did have. We still have. So we did have a on-site lab actually. Okay. So we, we could be putting it. Applied in the industry, we shut it down about a year ago, but we could, you know, bring it back up there. I'm, I'm curious about the, the actually loading the traps when you when you load them. How much physical? How much time do you have? Do you have a lot of time to? I mean, it's another thing to think about when you're making a bait. You're basically stuffing something in a bag. Do you pre do you make these bags before you go out? Or? Yeah. Not not each day, but when you're loading the boat on the at the wharf, yes. Right. Do it. Well, not necessarily. You could you could have to hire another guy, like to, to hire your kid to do it on the wharf while your other crew. Is. But they don't. <laughs> in the first of the season, um, it's not as it's not as uh, not a final line that the bait needs to be perfect. They're hungry, they're going to crawl. They haven't been fed for six months. So they're going to crawl from most anything. So the first day, it isn't a necessity to keep the bait frozen. You might bait and blow the boat on Saturday, and you might not make it a four or five day delay. So you might only have to track, you might only get water on Friday. So that bait's been sitting on the boat since Saturday. It might be completely much, but you'll change it the first day and put the fresh back on. But they're hungry to crawl over there. Okay. They're ready to go, so they're going to crawl for that. No matter what, it might not be the best, but they're still going to crawl. So if you're using a fish waste stream of over 10%, uh, which is what one of the criteria for the for the challenge, um, you know, if you use 100% fish minced fish and just throw it in, it's going to dissipate. You have to have something to hold it together. Um, but whatever. Whatever is fishing the lobster, whatever flavors, the fats, the other compounds that are coming off of the rotten fish, they're probably, if they're thawed out and the temperature is warm, they're going to be going out in the big blobs rather than your, you described putting a whole fish with the guts in earlier on. And that's like the most ideal situation possible because you've got the compounds just leaving the fish as it starts to deteriorate or when a lobster starts picking at it. So the real challenge is trying to get that minced fish not to just throw out all of its compounds instantly. Mm. You've got to find some way, some barrier to Sorry. prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. And that's like yeah. like you yeah. said, it's probably going to end up being a combination of artificial yes. bait with a red fish or with a, a, a quick pour yeah. with a yeah, with the yeah. With yeah. yeah. Like yeah. Beach, it's probably going to be a combination of something. And then you're still going to be using a massive yeah. amount of fish and resources that way. If you get just, I mean, ultimately, it'd be great to use, because these, these fish, the red fish and other things like this, they may be underutilized right now, but they're not going to stay that way. No. I mean, there is so many resources in the ocean, and I have clients coming to me day after day looking for this compound of this fish and that compound of that fish. And how do we get it out? I just dip it in alcohol and say, here you go. Works out. Good extraction. But uh, there's, there's a, it, it's going to be quite a challenge to get there. And you guys may have some great innovative ideas, but like I said, having the right, the, the tools, the more tools that you have, the, the ideas, like if there's a drying component, if there's a, you know, strategic freezing, a temperature control during some of your process. Um, you want to think about those things too, to think about how that will impact the end result. Because right now you all have in your mind probably, I know this one or this secret recipe will probably be great for fishing. But you have to think about how quickly that, that oil comes out. Is it all going to happen? First, not just break down, but is the oil all going to be gone in the first hour or two hours? And the, the fishing compounds, and then the rest of it is just sitting there as a glove that nobody likes. You mentioned the recipes, but the, I know if you tell you or Sid or anybody here that fishes, um, if you put a crab on the shrimp, just a crab, it's good. But you can't put a crab in a, in a heron. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because that cancels both on that. Yeah. Yeah. Pop comes up with, mm. that's what happened there. You put a heron on top, you got to throw a heron. Weird. Crab. Underwater. 
to be on the chest and crack one. Not a dead crack, but it used to be on the body. One of the research papers we call work by the And at some point, but you can't, you said that a recipe might not be taken. Now you can put a crab in a piece of crab, you smash something big, or you can put a crab in a piece of flounder. But you can't put a crab in here. It don't work. Has anyone ever tried to use fish feed as bait? Fish feed? Yeah. yeah. Fish feed? Fish yep. Uh, Marshall's buddy, like to hang around Sammy. My buddies and Grandma and Ann always joke that they want to get paddled with fish feed. Throw the fish, fish around your pole. And the fish around your pole. Has anyone tried? Yeah, I, I looked at some of the old, old uh, patents. Like, there's a whole bunch of intellectual property online from like 1930, I guess, guys have been playing around with alternative things. And, uh, and there was one guy, a few, like the fish teeth and stuff. I mean, feed companies know how to formulate stable diets. They know how to attract fish. I mean, there's shrimp diets out there. There's lots of different diets out there that maybe, you know, maybe there's technology. I'm not saying go out and buy salmon feed and use it as bait. But maybe there's technology from that industry that can be used to make a, uh, a bait, alternative bait solution. You know that plaster of Paris that I was talking about earlier, one of, one of the scientific studies that they did is they literally took a heron, a mackerel, and a menhaden, and they, they put it in a tank of seawater, and we were talking about shaking the tanks or, or tank of seawater to see it break apart. They would shake the tank um, so that it mimicked the ocean. They were they were trying to do this all scientific. It didn't sound that great. But anyway, they would take these, this fish, and then they would take the water from that fish at different time points and analyze, run it through their equipment, and analyze this, the specific compounds that were coming out. And they narrowed it down to some of these compounds, and that was their idea for saying, well, what if we get these artificial compounds, put it in plaster of Paris, stir it all in, design it so that it, it lets these chemicals out at a slower rate, um, and uh, let's try that out. And so they're in a business down there, they're doing it. There wasn't much more information about it, but, but that was one of the techniques they used to try and determine what these compounds were coming out of the fish. But it's very complex. Like you said, if you have a herring and a crab together, it doesn't work. So, so you have to go with your experience, and you guys have the most experience of all. Thank you so much.
the time they wanted something different because because they're competing in the other guys they want other you always want something else
everybody is well fed and content again, so this is a pretty good time slot, I think. So uh, I introduced myself this morning. My name is Angelique Leblanc. I am CEO of the Western Regional Enterprise Network, and I am going to speak uh, briefly about the network. But I would also like to take the opportunity, since we have a lot of people from the region, but we also have a lot of you who are from other areas in the province and also other areas in the Maritime. And other areas from the Maritime. So I'd like to take the opportunity to just showcase the region while I have you all here. So we're going to look at the, uh, the western region that we represent is the entire uh, western part of the province. Our organization, we're a regional economic development or organization. Uh, we have seven municipal units in our area. So we have five municipalities, two towns from Digby to Barrington. And we work really on two levels. So we work with businesses one-on-one. -on -one and we help them navigate the numerous resources that are out there for them and we um, facilitate accelerate connections and we also work on another level where we work on the broader business environment so oftentimes we work with associations with partners to work on issues that are common across the region so that's why we have such a large interest in this lobster bait challenge because we see industry coming together with partners, stakeholders, to work on a common problem. So that's exactly the kind of thing that we're interested in doing. <coughs> so there you can see our region. So just a quick high-level overview of what the region looks like. We're going to talk about um, some of our natural strengths. Of course, the people. So we have a population of just under 50,000. Um, and this is a challenge that we're facing here in southwestern Nova Scotia. It's not unique to here. It's common in rural areas across the country and internationally as well. So we have a demographic issue. We have an aging population and we have an out-migration of youth. So that's a challenge that we put a lot of our effort into solving. So a lot of the programming that we do, I'll talk about some of that programming briefly, is to help address some of those issues. The local economy, as you all know in this room, is driven by the fishing industry at every level of the value chain and the number one export for the region, and most years for the province as well, is lobster. We have a bilingual advantage in the region, 30% of our population are bilingual, and we have, we're known um, for having a friendly and loyal and talented workforce in the region with an expertise around natural resources. So the depth and the breadth of the experience around the fishing industry here is one of our greatest assets. And we're also seeing new talent that's emerging from places such as Ignite Labs, and the local institutions that we have, NSCC, Université saint anne and we have a really tightly knit network around the province of um, academic institutions. So some of our natural strengths, of course, and this work is, you'll find this on our website, westernren.com. Um, Western sorry, westernren.ca, and what we want to do is we want to put our best foot forward to people who are interested in doing business here in southwestern Nova Scotia, but it's also to be used by businesses who are operating here. When you're out there in the marketplace, when you're putting together a proposal, um, anything that you need to help kind of drive these things home, that work is there for you. So our positioning in terms of having access to global markets, Western Nova Scotia is ideally situated to have access to these markets, major markets in New York, Boston within one to three hours of flights, um, access hopefully very soon to Bar Harbor, Maine, but also to Boston via the ferry connection in Digby. Um, immediate proximity to Canada's ultra-Atlantic gateway, which is the Port of Halifax. 
which provides access to 75% of the world through that gateway. So that's really an ideal, makes us an ideal export location. And we're also ideally situated to exploit trade agreements that are currently in place um, with CETA and the USMCA. And our time zones for working with Europe, Europe, sorry, with Europe are favorable as well. And we've been talking about bioeconomy opportunities. So that's really exciting in terms of the lobster bait challenge, but we have these rich opportunities in sustainability and the bioeconomy. And the sustainability piece is key as well. Um, there's an integrity there when we're talking about traditional industries and also some of the emerging industries that we remain um, conscious and aware in the practices in terms of maintaining our natural resources. So we're globally recognized for our natural resources with a significant raw material supply from the bottom to the top of the value chain. And that really covers agri-foods to nutraceuticals. So we've been talking about some of these opportunities today. I think half of my slides have disappeared, the top part, but that's okay. I'll speak to them anyway. And we're also part of Canada's Ocean Supercluster, which is another huge opportunity. Uh, private sector and federal government co-investment, which positions this region to um, really catapult from the opportunity and to become a global leader in the knowledge-based ocean economy. And there are projections by the OECD that the ocean economy is going to more than double in size by 2030. So there's no denying that Western Nova Scotia is going to benefit from that. And then if you add to that, and that you can actually see on the slide, are the cost of land, which is extremely cheap. Um, that's a big asset for our region. And we're seeing a lot of people who are moving into this region for exactly that reason. So if you compare, compare that to the price of land in Ontario or British Columbia, there's a huge difference. So that is a competitive advantage for our region as well. So if I can speak to the talent again for a moment, um, our population is highly educated. Over 70% of our residents have advanced education credentials. And as I mentioned, given the abundance of natural resources, it's really no surprise that 15 percent of the population is employed in natural resources and agriculture related production jobs. Our local labor force is about 26,000, but there's also an aggressive immigration plan in place for the province of Nova Scotia, and we're involved more and more in those immigration um, programs as well. And there's also tremendous supports out there for companies who are looking for labor market programming to help them address some of the labor demands that they're having. So one of the key issues that we work on is availability of the workforce at every level throughout the region. That's something we hear consistently, and again, a lot of the work that we do is to address some of those, some of those issues. And our quality of life, I think, is really second to none. Um, and the short, what's really the, the kicker, uh, I guess that can close the deal a lot of times when you're on the 401 in Toronto and it's taking you hours to get back to your home at the end of the day. Our average commute time in the region is 9.83 minutes. So that's tremendous. pretty good. And we're ranked second for cost of living and also, as I mentioned, top-notch universities throughout, throughout the province. And higher education, there are a number of programs in place throughout the province, and I think what some people don't realize as well is the cluster that we do have here. So there are 83 programs in fisheries and aquaculture, engineering, environmental sciences, biological sciences, and technical trades. And there are specialist education programs in biological sciences, marine resources, fisheries, and aquaculture. aquaculture. So what that translates to is a talent pipeline. So there's about 5,300 graduates in those 83 programs. So if you stop for a minute and you think what that means and that represents, we want to make sure that we're harnessing that talent here in the region. And I won't list them all. R&D, um, research and development networks, the support system in Nova Scotia is an extremely tight-knit network, 
As I said, a lot of what we do is connecting uh, business owners to resources, working with our partners throughout the province. So once you get into that system and you get kind of streamlined, you'll be connected from one service provider to another. So right now, the ground is just ripe with opportunities to help support businesses with doing R&D. And we know that the costs associated to that are extremely high. So it's great to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. And why conditions are ideal, again, in Western Nova Scotia for the fisheries. We're growing. Western Nova Scotia is ranked first in terms of export growth of food and beverages compared to its closest competing region. We've got the globally renowned fisheries industry and we have a highly developed ecosystem of over 1,100 companies, including MSC certified fisheries producing for global markets. And I should probably speak to the closeness of those companies operating within the region as well. It's great to have everybody in the room together today and having this conversation, but we know that those networks exist outside of here as well, which is tremendous. And of course, I have to mention the innovation that's happening in boat building in the region as well. So just to get to our services and what we do at Western Wren, we do have a Business Now program. That's our flagship program. That's to help with the business navigation. So it's an ongoing relationship with our, our Business Now lead, who is Andrew Melanson. We have a connector program that is managed by Brenda Lagrader, and that's mainly for people who are new to the region or recent graduates to help them build a network. And really, it uncovers the uh, hidden job market in the region as well. We have the Atlantic Immigration Pilot. We've been working with numerous employers across the region, getting them designated for this pilot program. And what it is, it's an employer-facing immigration program. So if you have year-round employment and you're, you've tried advertising in the local market with no success, you become designated under that program and then you can hire internationally. And we have a program that we launched in April. So another thing that is really important to everybody in this room is the importance of the local supply chains. And because of the population issue we have, people getting, or the demographic issue, people getting over, who's going to take over the business? We've become really intentional in working with businesses that are poised to sell, to sometimes they maybe think, what options do I have other than close the doors? So we're working with those business owners to help them in terms of um, finding somebody to take over that business. So that means working with youth in the region, it means looking internationally, and we have a network of interested buyers. And then, I'm excited to announce, it's the first time I can say it uh, pretty much officially, but it's back, our continuous improvement program. So this is, a this is a program that we piloted two years ago. We worked with a number of companies across the region, but it's looking for efficiencies in the business, um, getting some consultants in to help with that, and uh, there's no doubt there's an impact, direct impact on the bottom line. So stay tuned for more information on that one. We're going to be doing intake of about 10, 20, between 10 and 20, depending on what the need is of businesses across the region. So, and we thank ACOA very much for, uh, for that great partnership. So I will be here afterwards if anybody <coughs> has any questions about any of the programs or any information. And uh, maybe just one last thing is that soon, currently we're located down the street, but as of Friday of next week, we're going to be right next door through the kitchen. So we're really excited about that. So looking forward to some future partnerships and best of luck to everybody with the Lobster Bay Challenge. Well, thank you so much, Angelique. Uh, I think that you can see there's a, a natural fit. Uh, I'm sure as we receive the applications and move through things, we'll be able to reach out to the rent to uh, create additional partnerships and collaborations. So I think that's excellent. So I'm going to ask Ashley to come up for just a couple of minutes to talk about the Seafood Accelerator, another funding uh, program that may connect here with this project. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, yeah, just really briefly, I wanted to let you know about a new funding stream that Perenia has. And the money comes from the provincial government, their Building for Tomorrow Fund. And the goal is really to help grow and add value to Nova Scotia's seafood industry. So there's three streams that are available for funding. Um, the first is to help companies either enter or maintain new markets. 
So if you're interested in a GFSI certification, if you want to go for BRC, something like that, our, uh, we have a really great quality food safety team and we can come in, <coughs> go through your plant, look at your products, we can do a gap assessment, find out where there may be areas that need improvement. We can do program training or coaching and then we also do pre-audits. So before BRC comes in and does a final assessment, we can go through it all and really hopefully make sure you have the best chance of success when uh, the main auditor comes in. So that's one thing to help you maintain or enter a new market. Uh, the other two streams we have are around product development. So Perennia has an innovation center, Marilyn mentioned that earlier, in Bible Hill. And I'm really happy to say that, um, well, in the past, Perennia has been very agriculture focused. We're trying to really build our seafood expertise. And we are hiring a full-time seafood scientist at the innovation center. So that's going to be really fantastic and very beneficial to the work we're trying to do. So if you have a product, so there's two streams under the product development. Um, the first one is if you already have a prototype, but it needs some sort of technical obstacle that you need to overcome or some refinement of the product, we can help with that. So we can do recipe adjustment, reformulation, if you need um, analysis or shelf life testing, there's money available through that stream to help you really improve, refine that product and have the best chance of commercialization success. Um, the other stream, the final stream, is for a new product. So if you have a concept and you want to develop a prototype, this is where we have some funding available. And we can help with all the recipe formulation. Um, we also will do um, a market validation. We want to make sure that there is room in the marketplace for this. We want you, again, to be as successful as possible. So, for example, I guess earlier we were talking about a Quahog burger that used to be around here. If you want to, you know, create something, and we also are very, very interested if it's using fish waste. That, that has a very high likelihood. If it's a project that makes sense, we would love to fund things that are using some sort of this byproduct. Um, so yeah, if you have a concept, a, a burger, a meatball, anything like that, come to us and talk to me about the program. We'll see if we can um, get the right steps, the right ingredients together and help you develop something that could be successful and delicious and help your company grow and make more money. Um, so we have these little booklets that describe everything. My contact information is in the back. If you just want to talk about it, if you want to learn more about the program, contact me anytime. I would love to love to talk. Um, there is a 50-50 funding requirement, so Perennia would pay 50% and the company would be required to pay 50%. We really want to make sure that companies are invested in this. Um, and we have money available this year and next year. So yeah, we're, we're really excited about this. We hope that uh, the industry will take advantage of it. So let me know if you have any questions, reach out by phone or email. I've had a lot of uh, calls and it's open for wild fisheries, for aquaculture and marine plants as well. Combo of all if you want, whatever, uh, any ideas you have, we would really love to talk about with you. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, thank you. And of course, there's also uh, information on the website. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. For your website. Yep. Okay, so let me get on to the next steps here. <coughs> so I have I have um, the application and the information package here in a hard copy, and I'll put them on the table or somewhere here to make sure everybody has access to them. But they're also on our website. So let's talk about the next deadline and the next uh, important step. And that's the letter of intent or the application. So all the great ideas that have been percolating here today, we'd like to have your letter of intent. It's fairly straightforward application. Just a little bit about you and your team that, that's involved in the um, lobster bait, alternate, alternative lobster bait idea. About two to three hundred words uh, about your idea, so kind of an executive summary. And then just send them into the address on the bottom. So it can be me or it can be uh, Jennifer Malik, who was, who's also working with me. So any questions you have about that, don't hesitate to call. The number that's on the website and connected to this for me is a cell phone number, and I pretty much have it with me all the time. So don't hesitate uh, with questions. It's important that you get your idea in and give us a sense of what it is. We fully expect that there'll be ideas at all different stages from just just the thought process to something that's already been formulated to something that's been formulated and tested. So we fully expect that to be the case. And we will make sure that we reach out to each and every one of you with some follow-up. So if you don't hear from us for some reason, again, just reach out. Don't hesitate. So what are we looking at for requirements? We've had some discussions today, pretty full discussions about uh, what we're looking for. So 10% 
of fish byproducts. Um, we want to make sure that we use a certain amount of, of sorry, of waste or, or fish byproducts that um, will help to attract the lobster as well as continue on the same vein that we currently are on. So again, a big part of this is not just to create an alternative lobster bait, but also to be utilizing all parts of the fish. We want to make sure we have a good rate of decomposition uh, so that we uh, don't just have the bait disintegrating in an hour or two hours. Again, we talked about that today. Uh, we'll look at you know what's attractive to lobster. Is this bait that you're proposing going to be attractive to lobsters? If so, how, how in what way do you expect that to be the case? Um, is it a product in a form that will be easily used by lobster fishers? Fishermen? And that's important so that because if it's if it's too complex to to access it or to use it it's not going to be a, com a commercially viable product will it be comparable from a price perspective and what kind of shelf life can we expect so those are just some of the things that we're looking at in in the kind of high level big picture sense and we will be sent when we receive your applications we will be sending you out further details at each and every step and also on our website we'll continue to keep things updated there as well so you want a summary of the two to three hundred words on your on? Yes. And on your on your idea, right? What's your idea? Is it I don't know, is it to make it out of you know molasses cookies with a little bit of extra ginger? I don't know. Just say it, right? So those kinds of details. Yeah. Um, so then following that we will have uh, a pitch. And the pitch will, again, will send the additional requirements. Um, why your bait is best, what's it made out of, because as we talked about today, we want to make sure that all the components are components that are going to be safe for the environment. The rationale for its composition, so why, why have you chosen the things that you've chosen in the form that you've chosen it, etc. Any plans you might have for commercializing it. Any challenges or issues you already can identify with this, problem, with this alternative bait. And of course, also the importance to be succinct because every word will count. Uh, but we'll, and we'll have time time limit on that kind of thing as well. And we'll again send you all the details about how long and all that kind of stuff. The various components. So from that pitch, we expect to get three semifinals, and it's those semifinals that will be uh, involved in the sea trials. And we expect to do that in October through a special license from DFO. Heather's already working on, and uh, those sea trials will be um, managed in coordination with ourselves and Cold Water Lobster Association. So we want to make sure that we have experienced people that are involved in this and then know what they're doing. So that's, I think, a real positive step. Um, and then the winner will be chosen late October, early November. It'll be a $30,000 cash prize, but I think the most important prize will be the fact that you will be connected with industry. And you can see today we've got people from a lot of different places, both geographically as well as different professions in different areas of the fishery. And that to me is the biggest uh, prize is to be able to have that kind of access to everything from a, a processor to somebody like Seacrest to a uh, fisherman that actually will use the bait. Everything I just said is all on these websites, either the Ignite website or the perennial website, and I have to have copies of things, hard copies as well. And I just want to say, uh, make sure you call if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Um, myself, Gail, Ashley, anybody will be able to help you out. And um, I want to thank you all for today. I found it very, very interesting. And before I close off, I just want to check, see if there's any questions. Yeah. Can, can, uh, can I, can someone participate without being involved in the actual challenge? Like, like I'm not interested in the prize. I'm interested in getting a product out of the water. And I'm not too sure if it's going to be relative to lobster, but it would be a bait. Well, I, I'd say this. For the two-page application that you have to do, put it in, and then we can talk. Or we can talk offline maybe before okay. you submit a new one. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So if you're lucky enough to be one of the selected ones, of the three, yep. you know, all the testing that's going to be done by cold water group and things, that's all included, that's all free, basically? Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah.
and I should note too, uh, I do want to make it clear that the uh, Cold Water Lobster Association will not be on the selection committee for that. Uh, we are stepping away. We're simply providing the, the captains and the vessels to uh, the test debate uh, and be as unbiased as possible. And again, with all the variables that we have to look at. So uh, we are there simply to be the industry hand, but we are not on the selection committee. And all the uh, all the results will be recorded in a manner that everyone can see and think and yep. go yes. forth. Yeah. We'll yes. make that we'll make that public. Yep. Anything else? Who yes. hears the pitch? Pardon me? Who hears the pitch? The judging panel and the panel will be composed compo composed of researchers, food scientists, and some industry. Will that be done here? Most likely. Yeah. Is there any chance at all that anybody from DFO um, will or could be on that panel, or that's the hope that we'll get filled. You know, that can be the, the some of the expertise. We don't have the panel identified yet, but we do know that they're going to fall into those kind of categories. Yep. Well, will you would you will you guys accept research that's been done somewhere else in other countries? Oops, in what sense, Andy? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, what, in what sense? I don't understand your question. Well. Research that's been done on this product, but yeah. in a, not in Canada, in the country. but but for a fishery, <laughs> scientific. Yeah. 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 That would come down to um, assess how yeah. easy it would be for lobster fishermen in Nova Scotia. Yeah, it's been actually tried, that that tried in a fishing environment, yeah. but not for lobster. Yeah. 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 by uh, uh, Norwegian uh, bait for longline and came in a sausage. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Somebody just actually raised the issue about IP. Maybe we should mention about IP. Yeah, in, in the information kit you'll see, the IP belongs to the uh, person who, the creator. The inventor. And uh, it does not, it does not sit with us at Perennia or Coa or Ignite. It belongs to the uh, inventor yeah. or yeah. the creator. Yeah. So it's, it's protected, I guess, if anybody owns any intellectual property or any license. Absolutely, that's absolutely, all yeah. Sort of confidential. Yeah, that's right. And uh, we will ask you, perhaps, as part of the competition, to disclose some of your ingredients, but we'll do it under strict confidential issues and uh, yeah. conditions. You know, NDAs. with the uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, then we would share. Mm -hmm. uh, how much do we need? <coughs> like how many units or how many? Like how Sorry, for the test? Question. For the test, how much product will we need? Yeah, we'll send you all that detail. I'm going to say what 80 pounds is what I'm going to say, but I'm yeah, not sure of that. Um, they're going to be a pretty small trawl, and uh, each guy uses, I mean, it really ranges from a pound to three pounds of bait. So, you know, for the trial, I would, I would plan, yeah, we're doing 12 um, hot dog trawl, uh, approximately 14, 14 to 17 fathom apart. But it is a small trial, but uh, I would plan for 15 pots worth of bait. Yeah, I would say. <laughs> I'm just interested, what if you come up with a couple ideas that would actually be synergistic with each other, would work together? Would you consider contacting those individuals and say, you know, you've got a good idea, would work well with that idea? Possibly, but not uh, not in the initial stages, that's for sure. I'll be honest, we're, we're putting this together um, right up front by the seat of my pants, the seat of our pants, I should say in the sense that uh, it's a very short time frame. We're not excluding anything at this point, but we're not making promises that we're gonna be the answer to everything. So I would, I, we would consider it as we went through the applications and then we would reach out and say to yourself, if that was the, the example, and say, okay, what can we do here? Are you interested? So it may not become an, an actual part of this challenge, but it may be something that still gets developed outside of that challenge. Right, because somebody may have half the answer, and somebody yes. else may have the other yep. half. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the hope. The hope is not just that we get a winner from this lobster bait challenge, but also that we generate lots of uh, great ideas that can be further developed either through this challenge or through other avenues, like the Seafood Accelerator or like various different programs at the REN or whatever. And is there any chance that these uh, pitches, the ones that aren't successful, can we get information on them? I, I wouldn't think so, no. Okay. Not at this point. Not unless it was, not l again, not unless it was offline and I'd say to you, um, you know, are you interested in talking to anybody else? I'd say somebody else, are you interested in talking to anybody else? And maybe yeah. so, so yeah, you'd be something the you conduit for that. Right? Yeah, yeah, you, you, could, you could have a declaration at the end of the trial, um, the trial and if that individual wanted to sign off on that declaration that they're maybe not so much their 
idea that at least their name and contact could be. Well, exactly. I mean, if, are you yeah. willing to disclose what yeah. you found? Because, again, it's a, the whole opportunity is here. Absolutely. And communication is a key. Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah. Uh, I just said something. Does the raw material have to come from Nova Scotia? Well, it has to be available here in Nova Scotia for sure. So not in Atlantic Canada. So I mean, not in PEI. Well, no, because I mean we're we're looking for it to happen up here, right? It's open. This this contest is open to Atlantic Canada for sure. Mm -hmm. But we're really looking at species that will work here as well. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't have to be sourced from here, but they have to be. They have to occur here. Okay. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. These species that are, are But we have people from PEI areas. here, so I'm assuming that... Yep, yep. A lot of things are quite common, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Like when we do the, like the testing and stuff, and, uh, I, I think it's really great that a whole bunch of people are doing it. Are, are any fishermen going to be like involved in the grading or like in this contest? Or <laughs> when, we, when we make the products, and all these products get together and, and they're in the traps, are there any fishermen involved in like... Well, I think that's what's successful and what's not, because to me, they're really the guys that... Well, that's part of the score sheet, right? Yeah, so that will be part of the Heather. score sheet. Uh, we're working on an evaluation form now. I'll probably get a panel together with others. I mean, yeah. we have some fishermen here that I've asked to come and speak out in regards to hate. But as you're aware, and probably everybody in this room, everybody's going to be different. Uh, whether you're, you're fishing shoal water, offshore, spring, summer, every LFA is different. Um, every guy uses a different combo or... So, but we are relying on their expertise to at least provide that to the panel and say, look, here's a criteria, you can't overlook this. If it doesn't have this, 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 forget it. Um, I mean, the big ones being the, the fat or oral content and uh, the ability for it to hold up. If it doesn't hold up, then you have an empty pot and then you're wasting a lot of uh, resources and money. So, so yes, they will be involved. Anything else? And we'll, as I said, at each stage we'll make sure that we give you as much detail as we have. So it'll come up to you. We have your emails and I guess I should make sure that, Gail, you have the list of people that are here. Yep, that's what um, Make all sure that, you, that Gail has your email address and yep. we'll make sure that you're in, included in all the various aspects as they develop. Yep. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so very much for all the engagement. We're really, really delighted to have such a great interaction. And thank you for taking the time to come here today. Thank you. Thank you. Want to talk to us a bit? Well, that's what I've been doing, and I've got students working on it here. Oh, good. Thing. <laughs> you should talk to them. <laughs> okay, so I spent two weeks on a field with a teacher's team. Of course, I'm going to try to have them. I'm going to try to have them. I'm going to try to have them. I'm uh, so I start that Friday, but you can still reach my wife. Okay. That was a good time. And that was good. Yeah. But absolutely, yeah, this, this is kind of like a David. Okay.
an idea of pricing for the service. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
support going on for the library project in the past. And I'm also working with the boys who said that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. And when I was rolling, I grew up, he was younger than me, but he was Brad. Yeah. <laughs> 